okay, so just a few more words about myself. Um, uh, just to remind you what it already says, you've probably read, I was born in India, I was brought up in Scotland, I've got English parents, and uh, I've lived in a few places around the world over the years. And currently I, well, I first, in, first met significant numbers of migrants to, this, to my country uh, in my first ministry, which was in the city of Birmingham. And uh, it was a shock <laughs> because I realized that this was an area of life that I really didn't know much about, uh, but was intrigued to find out about it. And um, within a few years, our church was 40% Afro-Caribbean, 15% uh, Asian, with the balance, um, different kinds of British people. Uh, and, and there are quite a number of varieties of British people. So, yes, yeah, so it was a, a fascinating situation to have a, a first ministry in. Um, I currently lead a college uh, where 50% of the students were not born in the UK, but they live in the UK. And they are always asking the question about multicultural church and uh, how do you reach these white English people with the gospel. These kinds of questions ar arise all the time. So it's a subject that interests me a great deal. And I've come to love and appreciate uh, so many of the Christians that we have amongst our student body from 22 different nations. Uh, they are really interesting and amazing people um, who are gracious and um, willing to sacrifice in their service for Christ. So let's just think a little bit about um, the, the changing world in terms of uh, the way in which um, Christianity has grown in the, these last few years. It's an astonishing story. And just a brief re reflection, first of all, about the origins of the modern missionary movement. Um, sometimes people forget that one of the motivations for the first missions, Protestant missions, in the late 18th and early 19th century was not just to take the gospel to other parts of the world, but they had a motive of hoping that they could convert people in other parts of the world to help out in Europe, <laughs> curiously. Um, uh, Carey, uh, William Carey, uh, had a phrase for it. He called it the blessed reflex. It's not, not a phrase that trips off the tongue. <laughs> But uh, interesting that he had thought of that, uh, even at the very origins of mission, the blessed reflex. Um, he thought it would happen quickly. It's happening now. It's taken a long time. Uh, but it's, it's curious that he already had that in his mind. One other reflection on Carey and those, that circle of missionaries, you will realize, of course, that the focus of the very early missions was, in fact, um, Asia. It was China, it was India. And they were partly influenced in that choice by the perception that these were quite advanced civilizations and that therefore if we could convert those people that would have a bigger impact on Europe. Africa was um, not of great interest in fact to the early missions. And it was uh, much, much later that um, Africa became more important. But of course, as we all know, the greatest growth now is uh, happening in Africa. Um, so in a moment, we're going to talk, well, let's just, yeah, let's talk about the statistics a little bit. Um, statistics are always controversial. <laughs> Who's a Christian? Who's not a Christian? Uh, do we include Catholics? Do we include Orthodox? Do we include nominals? Do we not? Um, when we talk about Europe, do we include Russia? Do we include all of Russia or just the Western part of Russia? There are many, many questions when it comes to statistics. So uh, 
we're just going to deal with very broad generalities here and we can debate the statistics but they're more an indication of a picture rather than uh, something that, that's amazingly precise. But what we can say is that global Christianity in the year 1900, if we take all the categories of those who say they're a Christian, it was roughly half a billion uh, people. And today it's roughly 2 billion, it's a bit more, 2.3 maybe. And within the next few years, actually, it's projected to be 2.5 billion. Now, within that, uh, it's just fascinating to see the growth of African Christianity. So, uh, in the year 1900, there were less than 9 million Christians in Africa. Uh, and quite a number of those would be in ancient churches, like the Coptic churches of Ethiopia, Eritrea, and uh, Egypt. Um, so, when you're thinking of Africa south of the Sahara, there were really very few Christians indeed in the year 1900. Today, uh, that number is in excess of 500 million, could be 560, uh, and it's projected that by 2025, which is not far away, it'll be 688 million, and by the year 2050, 1.2 million. Very, very soon, uh, Africa will have the largest number of Christians of any continent, um, with the possible exception, well, it depends, it depends a little bit what happens in China and India in the next few years. But at the moment, that looks as if Africa will be the continent with the largest number of Christians. So, in global terms, there's an astonishing shift. In the year 1900, uh, something like 80% of the world's Christians lived in what we think of as the West, North America, Europe. Something like 80%. And the remaining 20% everywhere else. Um, quite a number, actually, in the Middle East. We sometimes overlook that. Today, those percentages have changed to an astonishing extent. So today, only 40% of the world's Christians could be said to live in Europe and North America. Again, it depends a little bit how you categorize Russia, but it's something of that order. So it's an amazing shift. In other words, the center of gravity of world Christianity has moved essentially from the west and the north to the global south. And we see that reflected in all kinds of ways. We see it reflected in uh, denominational life with denominational leaders now coming from the global south. We see it reflected in missions. So it's a fascinating shift and one that perhaps was not anticipated. Now, the other reality about all of this is that um, most of the tremendous growth, for example, in Africa has happened since the post-colonial era. And it, it's not too difficult to see why <laughs> that might be the case, but let's nevertheless spell out why that is the case. Um, I've often talked to my African students and I say, I like to have a little game with them, which goes something like this. So tell me, is Christianity growing in Africa? Oh yes, it's growing. <laughs> ah, but it wasn't always growing. When did it start growing? Oh, probably about the 1970s, 1980s. That's when it really started to grow. Well, why did it grow then? little bit of a silence, but eventually they'll tell me because the missionaries went home. Kind of a sad comment in a way, isn't it? But actually, you can, you can see it. Um, what, what they're really talking about is that it was possible, it became possible uh, 
for African Christianity to take on African clothes after the missionaries left. <laughs> when I was in Ghana once, I visited the first church building that had been put up in Ghana. Uh, still standing today, uh, it looks as if it has been taken from the English countryside and transported into Africa, complete with the spire and the bells and the pews and, of course, the pipe organ. Um, yeah, of course, of course. How can you be a Christian without a pipe organ? I mean, let's be realistic. <laughs> and, of course, the missionaries at that time said, no clapping in church. No dancing in church. No drums in church. <laughs> now, that's not so terribly important in one way, but it is symbolically very important in another way because, as Africans uh, will tell you, it's quite hard for African Christians to worship without clapping and drums and dancing. Now, why do I have that conversation with my students? Because actually, the truth is that they haven't learned the reverse lesson. Because they're wanting to bring African Christianity to Britain, and they wonder why it's not catching on. <laughs> so it's an important conversation to have. Um, it was very difficult for uh, white Western missionaries to see tremendous growth. That's not to say that missions were unimportant. They were very important in a whole host of ways. But <clears throat> the great growth happened under the leadership of local people who were able to contextualize the expression of the faith for that population, which has been the story of Christianity ever since um, the Council of Jerusalem, when Paul had that debate about what on earth was going to happen in Antioch with these Gentiles who seemed to want to join the church. Do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? At that time, it seemed perfectly obvious to the church that you did have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And what a theological tussle that was to come to a different conclusion. It's kind of the same question that we constantly face in missions today. Now, it's an important question because um, obviously the other thing that's changing, apart from the shift of Christianity to the global south, is that everywhere around the world people are on the move. And whereas in 1900, um, a very tiny percentage of the world's population ever, had ever met a Christian, <laughs> that's changing because of the movement of peoples. And of course, one of the movements that we're interested in uh, in terms of our own ministry is what's happening in Europe. So obviously, a lot of migration to Europe, it's actually a bit more complicated than people sometimes think. There's a figure um, of migration to European countries of 47.3 million. So just for the sake of convenience, nearly 50 million. Think about that for a minute. But curiously, that's a bit misleading because actually only about 30 million actually come from entirely outside the EU. Uh, 30, it's 31 million. The rest are actually people migrating within European countries. So, yeah, we need to be careful when we look at these stats. Um, the, the countries that have the biggest uh, numbers of, of migrants are the obvious countries because they're the largest countries. Uh, Germany, UK, France, Spain, Italy. These are, this is where the majority of migrants are settling. But it's a significant figure, though the absolute numbers are much smaller, it's a significant figure for some other nations in percentage terms. So, for example, Norway is surprisingly high as a percentage. But the country, anybody like to guess the country in Europe that has the biggest percentage of migrants? Anybody like to guess? 
Nope. 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 It's not one that comes to mind, actually, quickly. No, it's not Greece either. Nope. Switzerland. <laughs> and I think it's about 24%. It's astonishingly high compared with the percentages in, um, in other countries. So something fascinating is going on in terms of the sheer movements of people. And every indication we have is that actually this is going to increase, not decrease, in the foreseeable future. So we can either see this as um, a terrible threat to European identity and life and culture and language and people talk about being overwhelmed by uh, a demographic time bomb and so on and so forth. We can see it that way or we can see it as an amazing opportunity for mission. And uh, I hope that you'll see it in the latter way. But it's complicated, so let's just look a little bit about what's going on in terms specifically of mission. So mission to the West has actually been going on for quite a long time, um, in the sense that for quite a long time, in fairly hidden ways, the historic churches have actually been importing clergy from other continents, um, particularly the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but not just the Roman Catholic Church. Other denominations have been doing this as well. Um, secondly, um, one of the things that we observe, particularly amongst my student body, is that many of these are people who came self-consciously to Europe for their own economic interest. They imagined they were coming to a Christian country and so the idea of mission didn't occur to them because they just thought, well, Europe is already evangelized. It's already a Christian continent. Uh, I won't be needed. I'll just join a church. They got a shock. And that shock often awoke them to the possibility, maybe God sent me here, not just for economic reasons, but maybe there's a deeper purpose in my coming to the West. And many of those who are church planting, many of those who are acting as pastors, evangelists, uh, Christian workers of one kind or another are in fact uh, those who had no idea that they were going to be a missionary when they first arrived in Europe. Okay. Um, so, there are individual Christians who come um, self-consciously as missionaries. And, and some of their stories are amazing, actually, um, because they've, they've got no uh, mission agency behind them. Um, so, I'm, uh, very quickly, two examples, not two stories. The stories would take too long, but the two examples. Uh, somebody I know who's planted a church in West Bromwich <laughs> uh, from Ghana, and God gave him a vision of a place called Birmingham. And uh, he had to look it up on a map. He had no idea where Birmingham was. He wasn't sure at first if it was Birmingham, Alabama, or Birmingham, England, but God confirmed it to him in a dream. Now, there's no textbooks around these sorts of visions and dreams. <laughs> But it happens a lot uh, with these individuals who somehow make it to Britain with no support and find a way of engaging in mission. Another friend of mine uh, was a businessman in Ethiopia, very su successful businessman from a wealthy family, uh, became a Christian, again had a vision. God had called him to be a missionary in England, actually in Europe, but England was the base. Again, God called him specifically to a particular place, Leeds. He's planted a whole string of churches um, in uh, the UK, but also in different parts of Europe, even in Istanbul. Just amazing. But here's the thing. 
He was rich. And he's become poor to serve Europeans. There's some amazing stories amongst these people. The next category are there are increasingly there are sending churches from the global south who are sending missionaries self-consciously. Now we know about the um, obvious examples from Korea, uh, places like that, but now there are churches uh, from Africa uh, who are seeking partners. Uh, a good example would be Nairobi Chapel, who have built a partnership with the Anglican Church. Uh, now, Nairobi Chapel and the Anglican Church are a little bit different, actually. <laughs> um, but they've managed to forge a partnership around church planting, which is really quite amazing, actually. Uh, there are other churches, denominations, um, that are beginning to do similar things, and I think that will grow. A variation on that theme is that now churches in the West are beginning to realize that it's possible to seek out partners and to covenant with them to construct a partnership. So it's a kind of one step on from uh, that first uh, from the previous um, notion of um, churches which are sending. Okay, so let's uh, think about the implications of all that in terms of the challenges for migrant churches in the way. Okay, so what happens generally um, to those coming as, as missionaries, however they've arrived, whether they became missionaries once they arrived or whether they came intentionally as missionaries. What happens, of course, as we all know, is that they set out with the intention of winning lots and lots of English people to Christ, but they end up with a church that's of the same ethnicity as themselves. And this is disappointing for, for, for them, very often. I, I had a conversation with a man just recently, and he, he said, I've planted seven churches in England. And every one we intended for white people, but we only have people from my tribe. <laughs> not, not just from his country, but from his tribe. <laughs> Why is that, he said. Now, I could have told him why, because I just listened to him preach for an hour and a half. And it was incomprehensible. <laughs> to anybody from Europe. But that wasn't a helpful place to start. <laughs> Actually, we go back to the original lesson. What did the Europeans do in Africa? And what's the reverse strategy coming to Europe? So that was an interesting conversation. But it, I mean, what, what struck me was the sense of hurt and failure. Yes, he'd planted lots of churches, but it wasn't what he'd intended um, when he first started. So one of the challenges would, is obviously failure to move beyond their particular ethnicity or culture. Um, so in London, we have many, many um, large African churches. We have at least three that are 10,000 or more uh, in worship, and uh, sometimes they cause traffic problems. Uh, that's how English people experience African churches, traffic problems. Um, large numbers of these kinds of churches, but not many that have successfully bridged into British culture. Secondly, um, they're currently now failing to keep their young people because their young people do not speak uh, their parents' language, but either actually or culturally, uh, they are caught between feeling more British than their parents, but not feeling as British as English young people. They're caught in this strange trap. And of course, many of them are 
vulnerable to Islam, for example. And it's noticeable that many of the terrorists that have been recruited in the UK, for example, have come from Christian families. Uh, it's very, very sad. Very, very sad. I've met some of the Ethiopian parents who, whose children were recruited by ISIS. <laughs> Absolutely heartbreaking for them. But it's this isolation that uh, makes them vulnerable. So it's a problem for these churches. Um, actually, what's also happening is that many, many Africans, Afro-Caribbeans more particularly, are going home. <laughs> and uh, these churches are declining now because they failed to keep their young people and now they're feeling to keep, failing to keep their older people because their older people are going home. And actually, even amongst Nigerians, there's a move back because they've become wealthy in uh, Nigerian terms in London, especially when they sell their house. They can buy a city. <laughs> um, they become wealthy and they go back and think, you know, why not live like a king in Nigeria or wherever? So there's a huge uh, question mark about whether these churches, which have come in large numbers, can actually survive, let's say, in 20 or 30 years' time. And there's a very good case history around that because the Afro-Caribbean churches, which are earlier than the African churches, they arrived in the uh, 1950s, 1960s, they are in serious trouble. And there is a real question about whether or not uh, many of those churches will survive at all. There's also a failure to train for cross-cultural mission. Um, and uh, obviously that's an area that, that interests me because um, that's, that's where we're receiving large numbers of, of workers uh, that we are hoping to train in cross-cultural mission. I'll say a, a bit more about that in a moment. So some key principles in cross-cultural mission. First of all, successful cross-cultural communicators are not common. So sometimes the sad duty that I have with my students is to say, maybe you're not called to cross-cultural mission. And that doesn't mean that you can't help cross-cultural mission. You, you probably can, but it may not be as a primary cross-cultural missionary yourself. I came across a, an Anglican clergyman from Nigeria who was given charge of a parish in the south of England pri consisting primarily of 70-year-old women. And I said, uh, he'd recently arrived, and, and I said, what, what is your strategy? It's going to make it grow. He said, well, first I have to teach them to dance. <laughs> Maybe this is not going to work out. <laughs> I just had, you know, Okay, I'm 70. Maybe I could dance. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a pleasant sight. But uh, no, I think this um, maybe was one brother that was not necessarily called to cross-cultural mission. Um, there are some gifted cross-cultural communicators. And what we discover is that not always, but generally, there are people who've grown up in more than one culture. Not always. Sometimes people are just naturally able to cross cultures, but more often than not, you'll find that the best cross-cultural communicators have had significant exposure to another culture uh, at some portion of their life. Very important, uh, especially if it's as a child. I came across a church just recently. If we have time, I might even show you a brief video clip. Um, a church in the middle of England um, I told you a second ago about the um, Shell executive. His wife has planted a church, which he supports. <laughs> and uh, they have 20 nations in the church. It's unusual for a Nigerian to produce this result. And uh, I said to her, what's the 
largest group in the church? She said, white British. What's the smallest group in the church? Nigerian. Fascinating. How did she do it? <laughs> uh, it turns out she spent a good part of her childhood in England. <laughs> and then when she went home to Nigeria, she went to a uh, private school, a boarding school, that had people from many, many cultures and nations in it. So her natural uh, place of being was amongst people of many cultures. It just came naturally to her um, to communicate across cultures. Training by itself is not sufficient to make a cross-cultural communicator effective. Now, I'm not against training <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> but it has to be um, a particular kind of training. And the training will not uh, succeed unless there's a significant amount of immersion um, as part of the training experience. So some kind of placement that allows immersion in another culture uh, will, will often be necessary. Language uh, is obviously a barrier, but so is accent, actually. Um, my friend, the uh, missionary from Ethiopia that's planted a string of churches, they're actually all Ethiopian churches. He has got great English. He's written a number of books in English. He's got great English, but his accent is horrendous. It's very hard to understand him. And he's realized that his best contribution, if he's ever going to plant cross-cultural churches, is to train other people to do it. <laughs> uh, he can't do it himself. He's frustrated by it, but actually the heavy accent is just a problem. And it's not racist to say so. It, in communication terms, it's a problem. And uh, we have to just be realistic um, about what that looks like and, and figure out ways to overcome it. So remember that the essential task of the cross-cultural missionary, there's only really two tasks, two essential tasks. The first is to convert leaders from within the culture you're trying to reach. Leaders from within the culture you're trying to reach. Successful cross-cultural missionaries do not necessarily convert many people themselves. Think about what we were saying about Africa earlier. It wasn't the missionaries that made the masses of con converts. It was leaders from within those cultures. That's how, that's how it happens. So, for example, our local church wanted to um, win lots of young people from the local school. We didn't have any young people coming to our church. Now, we sent in somebody as a worker, and he was smart. He worked out who the leaders were, and he made sure that he got some of those converted. <laughs> happens that they were four boys who were members of a pop group. And he offered the church as a venue for their concerts. Our church was, I'd never seen so many young people. <laughs> boys, but lots of girls who were very interested in the boys. And loads of people came to Christ. But my friend, our worker, I think he only converted those four. <laughs> But those four were fantastic in terms of reaching their own age group, their own culture, actually. So that's the first task, convert leaders from within the culture. It doesn't matter if you, you, you don't, I mean, if you can convert lots of people, that's great. But, but that's, not the, that's not the first task. And the second task is to disciple them well. Disciple them well. It's the thing that we fail to do very often, isn't it? That we, uh, we see people converting, we think the job's done. But actually, it's just started. <laughs> the discipleship process 
is one that we don't do very well in Europe because we haven't had to do it for so long because we've been able to rely on the culture to disciple people. Well, we can't rely on the culture to disciple people anymore. We have to figure out from first principles what, what does it actually mean to be a follower of Christ? And uh, we've assumed so much because our culture has been impregnated with the gospel. Now that it's not impregnated with the gospel, we've got to go back to first principles. principles and we're probably going to have to learn from those Christians who remember what the process was. First of all, it was the Jews that were being converted. Didn't require a lot of discipleship, actually, because they were immersed in the Old Testament. But then the Gentiles started to become Christians. And that did require discipleship, and so they had to invent the catechumenate. And the catechumenate was a very uh, rigorous process, which usually concluded with exorcism. Maybe some of our discipleship processes will need to conclude with exorcism, given what people are beginning to involve themselves in in Europe today. We have got a lot of work to do in the area of discipleship. Okay, foundations are key. So let's go back to my friend who planted the seven churches, none of which turned out to be what he had hoped for. The first problem that anybody from another culture faces is that they are going to attract people of the same culture. And if you do that and start like that, it's fatal. It's all over before you've started. If, you're, if your initial leadership team is composed of a single culture, you can't create a multicultural church very easily. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you've immediately made your task very, very difficult. So we'll go back to my friend in the middle of England whose husband is the Shell executive. What did she do? Well, she was invited to start a church by a Malaysian Muslim. Curious. But it got her thinking. And so she was determined that from the beginning there would be people of different cultures meeting to plan this church. And then she was joined by a lot of Nigerians. <laughs> and after a couple of months they had a complaint. This church is not Nigerian enough. She said, no, and it never will be. And they said, in that case, we're leaving. She said, here's the addresses of some Nigerian churches you can go to. She was not worried. Now, mostly African pastors are worried when a group says that to them because there's, that's their salary walking out the door. But she didn't need the salary. So she said, there's the door. And so consequently, she's been able to create a multi-ethnic, multinational, multicultural leadership team, which is very, very important. Secondly, and this was more difficult for her because even though she'd been brought up in a number of cultures herself, still her experience of worship styles was quite limited. And um, she began to realize after a time that actually, without realizing it, you just walked in the church and all the worship group were black. And one day it just hit her forcibly. I'm going to have to recruit <laughs> some white European people for my music team because just visually it sends out a message, doesn't it? Straight away, there's a message. And uh, even, if, even if they've learned all the Hillsong stuff <laughs> uh, rather than Nigerian songs, there's a message. So she had to make some changes. So actually, not just the core leadership team, but thinking about all of the other leadership aspects of your church, whether it's the worship group or whether it's the uh, small group leaders or whether it's the workers in the Sunday school, it doesn't matter where, where your workers are, your outreach team, you've got to think about how each of these aspects is going to be significantly multicultural. Now remember that homogeneous and heterogeneous strategies can be used in parallel. So I could take you to a number of multicultural churches 
that nevertheless, so just to make sure we're all on the same page with the terminology, multicultural churches are heterogeneous, more than one um, culture. But within the church, they have homogeneous groups meeting. And there's sometimes very good reasons for that. And the first reason is because how someone comes to faith is different than what happens when they live the faith. So let me explain. My first church, uh, which I already said was, was multicultural, we were very pleased with the idea it was multicultural, and uh, we, we saw that as a, as a positive thing because in that community, our church was the only social place or space where different cultures met. Um, every other social space was divided. So we saw that as a positive. But I had to acknowledge that when I thought about the people who had joined our church, every single person that joined our church joined the church through somebody like them. In other words, of their own ethnicity. No, that's not a bad thing. It's perfectly natural, isn't it? When you're going to make the most important decision in your life, it's perfectly natural that you're going to make that decision based on trusting somebody. And who do you most trust? <laughs> People who are like you. <laughs> we do it all the time, don't we? If you're in a strange city and you want to ask for directions, who do you ask directions from? <laughs> Somebody that looks a lot like you. <laughs> the closest you can find. That's what you do. You just don't even think about it. So actually, how people come to faith is different than what we expect once people have become Christians for quite some time. The second factor in all of that is that, especially for those who come to this country and who are in need of support, either in terms of language or in terms of help with um, legal issues or help with um, yeah, economic issues, uh, actually they need somebody from their own ethnicity to help them for a time until they become established. So, homogeneous and heterogeneous are not um, separate options. They can work together quite nicely. Now, it is almost certainly true that multicultural congregations grow more slowly than uh, monocultural congregations. Not always, but often. There are exceptions to this general rule. Um, I can take you to churches that in Britain that have used this mixture, as I said a moment ago, between monocultural and uh, between um, uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous. They've used those principles really, really well, and they've grown dramatically as a result of that. Kensington Temple in London would be a good example of that. Uh, so there are exceptions to the general rule. Sometimes we can use these uh, realities to our advantage. But one, one of the things we need to think about is what's, what's going to happen in Europe? What's going to happen in Europe? Because the point about the new Europeans is they're probably not going back to their countries of origin. And their children are certainly not going back. And what's happening amongst our young people in the cities is that they are connecting in ways that we would find very difficult. And they're actually creating a new kind of culture, <laughs> which is interesting, actually. It's quite creative. Uh, it's often based around music. It's often based around art. It's often based around theater, dance, all kinds of creative expressions. A, there's a new culture emerging. And actually, this is a fantastic opportunity for us because there's no reason why this new culture couldn't also be a Christian culture. In fact, I think there's a great opportunity to ensure that it's a Christian culture. Um, because it's a way that those who are born in Europe 
but don't have European parents can make sense of what it means to be a European. Because you can say to those people, this is not our home. <laughs> For anybody who's a Christian, this is not our home. We're all aliens. We have another home. And because we have another home that we dream of, we can make this home something to be proud of. Something that we can build as a Christian vision of what it means to live in community, of what it means to build community, of what it means to transform a nation and a continent.